Hey people, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast, to the place where we believe that another world is still possible and that if we all work together, there is time to create the future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. I'm Amanda Scott, I am your host in this journey into possibility, and this is our bonus podcast to mark our 200th episode. Go us. It feels like more of a turning point than our first century did. Doubtless, partly, this is because I have just handed in the fifth draft of the novel. Yay! So I've got a bit of a break before we dive into the next set of rewrites. I do think we're going to at least ten drafts on this, but we'll see. I've also just got home from teaching one of the Dreaming Awake in-person retreats, and if you listen to this podcast for any length of time... You'll know that always shifts my sense of what counts as consensus reality. I am definitely not grounded in what everybody else considers consensus reality as we speak. But mostly, the reason I want to mark the 200th and really didn't bother with the 100th is I have more of a sense that the world is genuinely on the cusp of tipping points now than I did back in winter 2021, when we hit the end of our first century. So, in this podcast, quite briefly, I want to have a look at where we've been, not just with the podcast, but with the whole Accidental Gods programme, with the movement, to give a sense of what we're here for, where we are, where we might go. So I'll start with a really brief recap for those of you who haven't gone back and listened to the first one and for those of you who have, honestly I'll keep this as sharp as I can. We began with a set of visions at the winter solstice of 2018 that led to the concept of accidental gods as a way to bring about the conscious evolution of humanity. In essence, we seemed to be being asked to teach the shamanic work we'd been teaching for 20 years at scale. And In trying to figure out how that might work, what it might feel like and look like, I began to understand that the next big human shift needs to be one of consciousness, consciously chosen. So evolution no longer getting faster or slightly bigger brains, or in our case, slightly smaller brains than we used to have. It's got to be a shift that's much more in our, the way that we work at an energetic level, our sense of who we are and how we fit into the world. So we need to shift our consciousness and we need to choose consciously to do this. So most of 2019 was taken up with crafting the Accidental Gods program, as it now stands, to do exactly this. At that point, I had absolutely no idea that there was going to be a podcast. It wasn't a thing. It was enough just to get the ideas together, to work with Caro to craft the meditations that were, are, designed to open the doors to connection with the web of life. My absolute aim is that everyone who works through this program, actually just basically everyone, has the capacity to connect with the web of life such that we can ask, what do you want of me, of something that is utterly complex, way beyond our comprehension, but into which we can plug as a node of consciousness. Ask what do you want of me, hear the answers in a way that feels authentic and real and grounded and respond to them in real time so that we can become what only we can be, each of us individually. I can become what only I can be, you can become what only you can be and you can do what only you can do in the way that only you can do it, being the best of yourself. And do that in concert with a million, million, million other nodes of consciousness, some of which are human, most of which are not. And in doing this, we don't need to know why we're doing it, because the bigger picture is not our problem. We just need to know what we can do, what is needed of us in the moment, and have the flexibility to listen to whatever we ask and to shift in real time. And this is easier said than done, I do know this. We have a terrible 
habit as humans of holding on to our sense of identity being what we do rather than who we are. That's one of the things we need to shift. So I worked with Caro to craft the meditations, worked endlessly with Faith in designing the website, and I kept shifting the design under her feet, and how she stayed sane is quite beyond me, but she did. And somewhere in the middle of 2019, it looked increasingly unlikely that we'd make the winter solstice deadline that had arisen in the first visions, and I would go up the hill and ask, and come back down, and Faith would go, okay, so we can just drop this until spring equinox, Beltane, sometime in 2020, and I would have to say no, I'm sorry. It's still winter solstice 2019, I have no idea why, but it really matters that we meet that deadline. And so thanks to some frantic peddling behind the scenes, we did. And we had that interesting first few weeks where we discovered that asking a group of people to find the core of joyful curiosity and kindle it in their heart space and keep it going all day and preferably all night, and then join it with gratitude and compassion as the three parts of heart-mind, might have been asking a little bit too much. So we had a little bit of time to do some rewriting on the fly, get it to a point where I wasn't asking too much of people, and then COVID hit. And we all went into lockdown. And it made a lot more sense why we'd had to get it out at the time we did, because we had it there as a resource for people in that crazy, disruptive, deep time reality of what happens when the entire edifice of our culture just stops. And then there was a bit more space and a bit more time, and I wasn't writing a book yet. And I'd got to groups with sound recording, and Caro had been down and sorted out the right microphone and the focus right, and all those good things. And it seemed useful to record some podcasts to explain why we were doing what we were doing. The neurophysiology, the neuropsychology, the general theory, the whole Ilya Prigogine concept of a complex system arising to maximal complexity and then either emerging into a new system or collapsing into chaos and extinction. All of those things seemed important to bring out into the world. And so that's how the podcast came into being. The first nine episodes are just me, riffing on what conscious evolution is and how we might get there and how we build habits properly so that we can come out into the world and use them, what heart coherence is and how we might get there, and generally giving a grounding so that Anyone could pick up the ideas and run with them. Because I believed then, and still do, that we will not get through the bottleneck of our polycrisis if we don't fundamentally change who we are and how we react or respond to the world. If we don't mend the schism that happened when we abandoned our forager hunter past and decided it was okay to own land. And I have recently read civilized to death by Christopher Ryan, which goes into this in so much more detail than I understood then, and makes even more sense of that concept. And we are not, any of us, suggesting that we move back to the Neolithic. We can't go back to caves, we don't want to. It's not who we are, and it's absolutely not going to happen. But we need somehow to bring the birthright of all of our evolution back to the point when we were hydrogen molecules in the Big Bang, to now, our disconnect is at most 10,000 years old. And that is tiny in the evolution of humanity. And for many people around the world, the disconnect happened much, much later. And so somehow we need to move back into that sense of connected belonging and then combine it with the extraordinary creativity that we have achieved on the back of the carbon pulse of the 20th century and all that humanity is now in the early decades of the 21st century and see where that takes us. So that was the first nine episodes. And clearly, we would not have got to 200 episodes if it was just me. But what I discovered is that podcasting is a whole lot of fun. So then I went out and found people I already knew who were likely to come and appear as a guest on a podcast that almost nobody had heard of. We had Chris Lutichar of Northern Drum, the renegade economist Della Duncan, who'd been one of my tutors at Schumacher when I did the Masters in Regenerative Economics. 
We had Rabbi Jill, who I'd met when I was teaching in the States. Sarah Schlotter, who does such beautiful, deep work on horse and human trauma responses with Equisoma. We had Rupert Reed, who has become a long-time friend of the podcast. We've talked to him several times. And it was fun. And it seemed to be catching on. And I discovered that I learn a huge amount just by doing the reading and crafting the questions. And asking questions is a political act. That alone made it worth keeping going. But the capacity to think very broadly, to not go niche, to not dive into regenerative agriculture or heterodox economics or shifting politics or the new spirituality that we need to bring or new ways of doing business or any of the myriad things that we have talked about in 200 episodes, to be able to talk about all of them to begin to weld those together into a coherent narrative that tells us who we could be if we let go of the whole death cult of predatory capitalism, that became the aim of the podcast. Elia Prigogine says that when a complex system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to shift the entire system to a higher order. And this, this, is what I am banking on now. How do we create these small islands of coherence? What do they look like? What do they feel like when we're in them that's different to how we feel when we're not? In the shamanic work, in the dreaming work, we tell the students it's the feel of the journey or the dream that really matters. And increasingly, I am coming to understand that the feel that we bring to whatever we are doing in the world is as important as the materiality of it. Sophie Banks said recently, we are human beings, not human doings. And this is true. And yes, the materiality still matters. I learned a lot from talking to Simon Michaud and then to B. Lorraine Smith and to other people about the materials crisis that we're going to hit very, very shortly. I kind of knew that business as usual was over, but I hadn't really grasped at a visceral level how over it actually is. Or the extent to which the future is going to look nothing at all like the past that we lived through and the futures that we have imagined. I watched a Climate Doomer YouTube video a while back, one of those things that someone sent saying, you really need to see this. And and I was at another gap between drafts, so I did go and have a look. And at the end of it, someone said, it's not that we power everything we do with fossil fuels that's the problem, though that's bad and not sustainable. And I would add that even the IEA, the International Energy Authority, has got to grips with this idea by now, so that's a good thing. But back to the video, this charming young woman at the end said, it's that we power everything we do And that is not going to be sustainable in the long term. And yes, this is true. We have to massively reduce our power use, those of us in the global north who use many, many more times the amount of power than the people in the global south. But we are not going to do this. We are not going to ramp down our power use while we are in the disconnect of modern existence while we still strive for more stuff to fill the gaps in being and belonging, while we don't know what we're here for. Because this, I think, is the big question of our times. What is humanity for? What is each of us for? What are you for? What am I for? We know for absolute sure that we are not born just to pay bills and die. But we still live in a reality where whoever dies with the most toys wins. And it's the inanity of this, the soullessness of it, the utter disconnect from our impact on the living, breathing, wild and magical web of life that is at the heart of our problem. Until we can shift that, until collectively we have a sense that being and belonging really matter and that they matter more than accumulating stuff and the power that it brings, we will not make the changes that we need. So at the moment, when I go up the hill and ask, what do you want of me? And endeavour to respond to the answer in real time, what I get 
is the crafting of ways to answer this question, not just for myself, but for as many people as possible. This is what the book is for. This is what the sequel will be for. If I get round to writing Dreaming the Wounded Bear, which will be the fifth in what was originally a trilogy and is currently four books, so I am following the Douglas Adams pattern, it too will be about this. Not just about the need to find what we're here for, but about the routes to do it. And then, having found a sense of being and belonging, how we might come together and act together to change the current system while there is still time. And yes, I am well aware that those of us who were born in the middle half of the last century are yesterday's people. It's the 30-somethings who are today's people and those being born and growing up now who are tomorrow's people. And the absolute sad fact of our world is that yesterday's people are holding on to the reins of power and are absolutely not inclined to give it up. So how do we change what those reins are attached to? Take the levers of power and unhook them from anything that can actually do any more damage. That too seems to me quite an important question. So to an extent, that's what the books are for. And if we run the Thrutopia Masterclass again next year, which we're thinking about, then that'll be what that's for. And all of that would not be possible without the depth of reading and talking and thinking that the podcast has pushed me into. So I also just want to take a moment to thank all of you who listen week in and week out, because if you weren't there, I wouldn't keep going. And if I didn't keep going, I would not have a clue how to write these books or even how to shape the Accidental Gods membership. This year we've been working on intention and I think we will continue to do that on how we set heart intentions. Not the health, wealth and happiness that grow out of our disconnection and our sense of scarcity and separation and powerlessness, but the connected intentions that arise from a heart-mind that does rest in joyful curiosity and gratitude and compassion for self and others. I still believe that human intention is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. But like connections with teacher plants or shamanic journeys, just the capacity to hone our intent is not enough. We can choose to use it in ways that are absolutely lacking in integrity that are selfish, that grow out of our sense of lack, our sense of unbelonging. It's the capacity to hone intent in concert with, guided by, in service to our heart minds and the web of life that really matters. So partly that's what the meditation that I'll do next will be about, and that's also what the intention intensives within the Accidental Gods program are about. So I also want to give a moment to thank the people who've been with us from the beginning. Really, again, we wouldn't keep going without you. And to welcome those who joined recently. And to say to all of you that we are exploring ideas of more gatherings next year. We have our baseline that have happened every year for the past few years and will happen again this year and next year of the duo of Dreaming Your Death Awake and then Dreaming Your Year Awake. So the first happens as close as we can to Xiaowei, and the next happens just after Hogmanay, which is the 1st of January, for those of you not born in Scotland. And we do them in that order, because it's my belief that if we don't learn how to die, we will not learn how to live. We need not just to come to terms with the reality of our own death, but to come to love that reality as a teacher in every moment of our lives. And then we can fall in love with living and infuse every moment with the joyful curiosity and gratitude and compassion that you have heard about once or twice already in the last 20 minutes. And then the world becomes a magical place that is open and flexible and resilient and in which we feel safe and held. And that, again, I believe is our birthright. That's what we expect when we're born. That's what our souls are yearning for. So Dreaming Your Death Awake will be online on Sunday 29th of October, which is as close to showing as we can get this year. 
at a time that we hope will be open to as many people around the world as we can. It runs for four hours, five o'clock to nine o'clock UK time. And then, as soon as we can on a Sunday after New Year, we'll run Dreaming Your Year Awake. You can do either of these on their own if you want. I think they're best done as a pair, but hey, that's because I designed them. Do what works for you. You don't have to be a member of Accidental Gods to come along to these. You get some money off if you are. But if you just want to come along and have a sense of possibility to give yourself a grounding so you can go off and do your own work in your own time, then just do it. What matters now is the most number of people come fully into heart mind. I am doing the best I can to set the groundwork for that, to open the doors, to give you opportunities. But please come and take what works for you. And if it doesn't work, then go off and do something else. And if there are other gatherings that you would like in 2024, then do let me know. Manda at accidentalgods.life. We won't put stuff on if we don't know what's useful. We are, as I said, contemplating running the Thrutopia Writing Masterclass version 2 next year with broadly a different suite of speakers because the original stuff is all still there and there is no point in relitigating that. Also, if all goes to plan, I will be writing the sequel to Any Human Power. So we will see how much energy and drive I have. But we are always open to ideas, so just throw the ideas out. And for sure... As we move into our third century of podcasts, we will be basing everything we do, everyone we talk to, on the understanding that if we can shape new stories of who we are and what we're here for, then there is still time for us to lay the groundwork for a future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. I do my morning ceremony every morning. I face the direction that for me is the place where the generations yet unborn are waiting. And I give a promise to do my best to honour their wisdom and to bring into being, or to help bring into being, a world in which they have a life. Because we are heading fast into the sixth mass extinction. And I do not want whatever future generations may arise, to look back and say that our generation didn't even try. So this is us trying. If you want to come and join us, you're welcome. If just listening to the podcast works for you, then I am really grateful that you are there. And if the meditations help, I am about to do another one like I did at the summer solstice. And there are literally dozens probably hundreds, actually, in the Accidental Gods programme. So if you want more, head over and have a look. Alrighty, that's it for now. Thanks to Caro C for the production and the music at the head and foot. Thanks to Faith for holding everything together, for listening, for exploring, for holding the conversations that genuinely keep us moving forward week on week. Thanks to Anne Thomas for the transcripts. And as always, and particularly on this 200th episode, an enormous thanks to you for listening. If you know other people who would get this, who want to be part of a different way of being, then as ever, please do share the link. And that's it for now. See you in the meditation. Thank you, and goodbye.